Hello, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Today, I want to talk about creating databases. Now, this is another part in my database fundamentals package. Um, we're going to create a database. We're going to do it really, really simply to start off with. Initially, I'm just going to use the graphical user interface. Now, ultimately, when you start doing real database administration, when you start really working with SQL Server, almost every single thing you do, you should be planning on scripting. You should be planning on using T-SQL and PowerShell and other mechanisms of automation to ensure that you've got a, a, a quick, easy, fast way to get things done accurately, and that is through code. But at least for a walkthrough and understanding, we're going to start with just using SQL Server Management Studio um, and the graphical user interface there to create a database. So we're starting off connected to Management Studio. And so that's the first thing we have to do is make sure that we've got the correct server name, um, the correct authentication set up. And I talked about that in a previous video. If you want to, you can go watch that to get you started. So when we connect up to the database, we will see that here's our list of databases um, and information over here in the Object Explorer part of the Management Studio window. The databases I already have created are listed out here and you can see various databases. To use the GUI to create a database is actually fairly simple. We can right click and there immediately is the new database command. Um, let's click on that and it opens up a new database window. Now this is very, very simple. All we really have to do is type in a new database name and so there we have one called new database. Everything else is going to set up by default. There's nothing else that we have to do immediately upon creation. You don't need to make any other additional changes. Nothing else has to happen. Now let's click OK. It's going to execute. It's going to open up the Object Explorer window over here on the left and you now see my new database. If we click on the uh, expansion, you can see that that database has got nothing in it just yet. Let's click on tables to see that. And so there's no tables listed. Um, yeah, there are system tables, but, but there's nothing else listed. Um, that's it. I have a new database at this point. But that's not enough for when we're normally setting up databases. We actually need to do more with them uh, to get things set up correctly. And let's talk about that. But first, let's get rid of this database. We can right-click on it, again, scroll down, and there we see the command delete. Let's click on delete. It's going to show us the database. It's going to say, do you want to delete any backup information? Now, traditionally, on a production system, I would probably keep the backup and restore information. That's very important. But in a development environment like this, where we're just doing testing, um, it's not as important. Also, close existing connections. Again, if you're in a production environment, I would avoid that very, very much. It could cause all kinds of problems. But here in a development environment, you could do that. Um, let's go ahead and do it now and click OK. And it will then remove that database. You'll see that it is now gone um, from the database listing that I had. OK, so let's create another database now and start to actually take more control. Again, right-clicking on the new database will allow us to open up the, the GUI and get that new database window. Let's call it my second database. So now we've got a second database in place. This is where things get interesting. We actually have to talk about file placement on databases. We need to talk about other information. Now, database owner is important. I'm logged in right now as an administrator on my system, and making the administrator the owner of databases is fairly common. It's not the only way to get things done, and if you want more security, you might be better off defining um, who the owner is, and you can go in here and it will pull from the list of logins that you've created on the database. Now, we're not um, going down security just yet, so we don't want to spend all that time. Um, the other thing we need to look at, and it's very important, is the file sizes on the databases. Now, initially, these things are all modeled off of the model database. It's a system database that contains a series of objects that are. Th it's then used to create new databases from. 
we have to probably make some initial changes to this. Um, first off, how big is our database likely to get? Now for these test databases, having it set up for eight megabytes is probably fine. But for a, for a larger database with more data in it, instead of letting it grow in little tiny chunks over time, you'd be much better off initializing it to a reasonable size. So, you know, let's say 500 megabytes or something, you know what I mean? And again, that's still a very tiny database as databases go today. Um, 5,000 so that you've got to actually five gigabytes of data might be more appropriate. Now we also have the log. The log is the number of transactions and the size of the transactions coming into your database. This is um, something we're going to spend a lot of time talking about log management, and I'm just not going to be able to get into the detail of it today. But the one thing I will say is, is that you don't need a log as big as your database, and you certainly shouldn't have a log bigger than your database. Log management uh, requires us to keep that thing under control, to keep it relatively small. I'm going to go initially with one that's about a fifth the size. That's not a rule. That's absolutely not a, a, any kind of thing. It's just something I'm doing at the moment. Now, the next thing we need to look at is the auto growth. Now, by default, again, driven by what comes from the model database, we see that it's um, by 64 megabytes and unlimited. Let's take a look at that. It opens up and now we've got this thing. We can enable auto growth or disable it and there's arguments to be made in either regard whether or not we have it enabled or disabled. I generally lean towards having it enabled. It acts as a safety valve and a protection for you. Now, that said, we have to start talking about how it grows. The default value of 64 megabytes, it's gonna be little tiny 64 megabyte chunks, is probably not a good choice for most systems. Probably you need to bump that up and grow in larger chunks. And the fact is, is that if you grow in lots and lots of tiny chunks, it actually can cause performance problems. So let's change that to, oh, we're gonna call it 500 meg chunks. So instead of, you know, instead of like a little 64 meg chunk, this 5,000, uh, this five gigabyte, 5,000 megabyte database, we're gonna add 500 megs to it every time we need to. Now, the other thing we have to look at is the limited or unlimited. We do not have unlimited growth in our file systems. So you probably want to start saying, well, hang on, my max file size can only be X, whatever X is. And that's going to be driven by your local system, by the drives that you're putting these data files onto. I'm going to leave it unlimited for the moment, but you're going to want to think about this and make plans for this as you're administering your systems. Let's click OK, and you'll see that that's updated. The log, same idea here. Let's move this over here so we can see it together with everything. Um, same idea here, growing it in chunks, percentage can be useful. Um, more useful for the log, uh, I like a, you know, that, that works well for the log. It doesn't work as well for data um, because 10% growth for a 1,000 um, megabyte file, no big deal, right? But 10% growth for a 10,000, 100,000, you know, multi-terabyte file, yes, this becomes very, very problematic. It slows things down radically while it's initializing these things. So you're going to have to have a dance around this. Also, the same thing goes with limiting this size to ensure that you do not fill a drive with these files. You do not want to have everything go to 100%. It will cause problems. So we make the decision here. We're just going to go with 100 megs. Small system, not the big deal. There we go. Now, the path to the data... This is a, a small local virtual machine running on my laptop for demo purposes. So the path to my data is the same as my operating system. In the real world, this should never be true. The operating system should be stored separately from your data, absolutely. And your data and your log probably should be stored separately. They have different access patterns, different behaviors, and putting them through different paths and on different storage systems increases the possibility of performance. So this is something else you want to take a look at. 
And then finally, there's the file name. You can change it. The defaults are going to be driven from the name of the database, um, but we don't have to do anything to that. We can also add additional files. So if you need to have more files, you can. We can give them names, and it's, again, now it's no longer driven off of the database. We have to provide it. So we can add that, and then there's different types of files. Logs or, or row, and we can have multiple ones, or we can do file stream. That's a completely different discussion. We'll have to have another time. Traditionally, you would be doing rows, and we'll go ahead and go with that. You can also create file groups that help you with management and placement of files. The primary file group is something some, some people stay away from um, intentionally as a way to, to control things, but, but again, um, that's a discussion that we're going to have to have another time. All of this is very detailed and can grow way out of control. So we're going to add a second one, call it another 5 gigabytes, and again we're going to change the default behavior so that it grows differently. Let's go right back over here. By 500 megabytes. All right, so with all of that in place, it's now going to be able to create this database. Now, I would like to point out there are additional things you can do. There are options we can do for when we create these databases. We can change the overall behavior of the database by switching things on or off or choosing different options. I'm not going to get into all of this today. It's a very, very dense topic. There's lots to discuss. We're going to leave everything as is for the moment and create a new database. You'll notice it's taking slightly longer because it was creating bigger files and allocating more space and so getting everything ready. Now it's just the same as before. There are no tables in the database yet. This is a blank database ready for us to start working with. And that was our goal today is to arrive at a point where we have a database that we could start to work with. All right, so there's how you can create a database, drop a database, um, and see what's in a database. And, and you know, it's a quick way to get going. It's a quick way to get set up. Just remember, please, that the most important thing you can do is to use scripting, is to use T-SQL. That's going to be the next part. We're going to do, we're going to use T-SQL to create databases, manipulate files, and all that fun stuff. That's it. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to this channel. There will be more fundamentals coming, and there's lots of other content, so you want to keep an eye on that. It'll be coming out, um, you know, twice a week, every week, and uh, just hit the, you know, I subscribe button down there, and um, we'll keep you informed of when new stuff comes out. Thanks a lot.